the birth of the church. Hey, good morning. That's what we're talking about today on The Daily Race. So glad to have you here as we are taking time each and every morning not to run a marathon, not to do some some heavy sprints, but just to intentionally take one step forward in our relationship with God. And we are uh, studying the book of Acts here for the next few weeks. And today we're gonna be talking about the birth of the church. How did this all get started? If you remember, uh, Jesus has ascended back up to heaven, but told the disciples to be patient. He was sending the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, they'd know exactly what to do. So let's pick it up here today in Acts chapter two, uh, what's taking place. It says this, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So Pentecost was a specific uh, Jewish festival. It took place 50 days after Passover. And essentially this was a, at several different meetings. Uh, at first it was just a celebration around uh, harvest time. So it was celebrating the harvest, giving thanks. Uh, as time went on, it really became a celebration of the law. Tradition had it that uh, the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai 50 days after the exodus from Egypt, which is Passover. So the the point is, it's a celebration day. It's a specific day. Um, it's not. This also gives us a little bit of time frame. We know from Jesus's death, his resurrection, how much time has passed until the Holy Spirit is sent. So it's on the day of Pentecost, all the believers are gathered together, and then the promise comes true. It says this, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames and tongues or tongues of fire settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. And the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, they were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. So a couple quick notes here. That this, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, there were some physical auditorial things that took place. Um, tongues of fire, the sound like rushing wind. This wasn't just in the disciples' mind. This wasn't just something that w occurred in a vision because everyone in Jerusalem came running. Everyone heard that something took place. They didn't know what it was, uh, but they all wanted to see what was happening. And then the Holy Spirit gave them a gift. The Holy Spirit gifts us for ministry. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts to help us accomplish the mission that he sets before us. In this case, he gives them the gift of speaking in other languages. Why? Well, it's a great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. There are people from all over the world right there in Jerusalem. And this was an important, this was the most important city uh, for Jews. Even though Jewish people have been spread throughout the world for all different reasons. So when I say the world here, I'm talking about kind of the, the Roman Empire known world that people moved around in. And they'd all come together there. They'd come together there for Passover 50 days earlier. Uh, some of them had moved there, having been out of town for a while. But they all spoke different languages. And all of a sudden, these disciples, these early followers of Jesus were speaking in their own language. Now, of course, this is pretty amazing, right? How is this taking place? Uh, they said, how can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phygria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs, <laughs> going through the list, people from all over the place. And we hear these people speak in our own language about the wonderful things God has done. So that they're speaking to them in a language they can understand about God. What has God done? The resurrection, Jesus, the Messiah. And they're telling them these things. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them. There's always those people in the crowd, right? Even when amazing, supernatural, once in a lifetime, and in this case, once, once ever time, things occur, there's always going to be some people in the crowd. There's always going to be some haters. Haters got to hate, right? They just have to ex explain away the supernatural. And what was their, their critique? They're just drunk. <laughs> These people are just drunk because that happens a lot, right? People get drunk and speak eloquently in other languages. That's, that's how that goes, right? <laughs> Once again, there's always critics. Peter stepped forward, 
with the other 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about it. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Now, what do you see is predicted by the prophet of Joel long ago? And what Peter does here is he begins going back to what they know. They know the Old Testament. Once again, these are, are Jewish people. Even though they, they speak other languages and live in other parts of the world, they're familiar with the scriptures. They're familiar with Joel. They're familiar with King David. So where does he start his, uh, his communication? From what is known. And how did he know to do that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's guiding him and directing him. Now, the Holy Spirit's giving him the words to say. Peter, who 50 days earlier couldn't even admit that he was a follower of Jesus, is now standing boldly in front of these crowds, preaching the name of Jesus, talking about his death and his resurrection. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit first gives them the tools they need to communicate, this, this language, uh, this ability to do this. He also guides and directs them towards the words, the words to use, bringing scripture to mind. Maybe, I, I don't know when the last time, we, we have no idea uh, when Peter had last read these passages, but at some time in his past, he'd been familiar with them. The Holy Spirit brought them right into his mind. So he communicates. He shares the good message. He's going back to the Old Testament, things that they uh, had known in their childhood, things that they've been familiar with. Uh, but then he brings it all together, pointing everything to Jesus. And let me kind of wrap up here what happens. In verse 37, it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? They made a convincing argument. They shared exactly who Jesus was, what he came to do, how the prophecies attached to them. They believed. And the response was, what do we do next? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Christ, uh, the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, your children, and those far away, all who have been called, who all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, urging, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about three thousand in all. Man, what a day. What a day. Now, there was no warming up to the coming of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like the Spirit, Holy Spirit came upon these disciples and spent several days or several weeks kind of getting to know each other and understanding their gifts and how they're supposed to be used. No, it was immediate. The Holy Spirit came, gave them gifts, pointed in the direction, and they left. They went outside. They boldly proclaimed. They followed the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the result, people got saved. Because the Holy Spirit was also working in those who were there. It wasn't just because Peter had a great speech. He was a great preacher. God was working in the hearts of those people out there. See, there's, there's one Spirit, one Holy Spirit working in believers, guiding us to take our next steps, giving us tools, giving us gifts, giving us abilities to do our part of what he's called us in God's kingdom. And the Holy Spirit is also working in the lives of unbelievers, pulling them, guiding them, prompting them so that they might come to faith in Jesus Christ. God's desire is that none should perish. And here we have one of these amazing moments where all of this comes together. The unbelievers, the believers, the Holy Spirit, gifts, abilities, and it's the birth of the church. It's the birth of the church. 3,000 people in that very first day. And this is just the start. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit works in us. And that's the beginning of the church. And we're going to read through the rest of the book of Acts as this church grows and expands, that the body of Christ went from these small group of meek, scared believers to a force to be reckoned with around the whole Roman Empire. God is at work. And you know what I love about this? Is he's still at work. That we are the continuing story of this. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the growth of the church didn't just happen, it's continuing to happen. God continues continues to gift new believers and to help them, to guide them, to help them grow to maturity so that this story is told over and over and over again. I'm just excited. I love, love reading this passage here about what God does in our lives. Let's, let's pause there today. Tomorrow we're going to look at 
What happens next? What do these early first believers start doing? The church is birthed, but what does it look like? What do they spend their time doing? And it gives us a great snapshot about what we should still be doing here 2,000 years later. Let's pray. Let's get ready for the day. Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, the way that you guide us and direct us. You give us gifts and abilities and, and the right words to say it at the right time. God, we just look at this birth of the early church and we just give you all the honor and glory. And God, we just look at, at ourselves here 2,000 years later, the legacy, uh, the, the history of saints that, have, have paved, that you've used it to pave the way before us. God, help us to be diligent in our call to carry this forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you 24 hours from now right back here on The Daily Race. Love you guys.